All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Uh, we're pleased to bring you today our E4C seminar series for 2021. The seminar series aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host a new research institution monthly and bi-monthly uh, to learn about their work in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and sustainability at large. Today's seminar will be presented um, by an incredible roster of speakers, including Dr. Irene Velez Torres, Dr. Diana Venegas, and Luis Fernandez, as well as our intrepid moderator and founder, Dr. Jesse Austin Brennerman. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the director of the Engineering Global Development Group at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and also serve as the president of Engineering for Change. The seminar you're participating in today is delivered in collaboration with Conservation X Labs and the Artisanal Mining Grand Challenge, which you'll hear more about shortly. We are honored to be joined by our incredible speakers um, who are addressing the critical issue of mercury pollution from artisanal gold mining. I wanna welcome you all again. The seminar recording will be archived on E4C's site, as well as on our YouTube channel. And both of those URLs are listed on the slide that you are seeing now. Information on upcoming seminars is available on the E4C site. And for those of you who are members of Engineering for Change, you will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, we encourage you to contact the E4C seminar team um, and also our webinars producer at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. We also invite you to share your feedback at the end of the seminar to inform our strategy. You'll be receiving a link to that survey. Um, directly. And if you're following us on Twitter today, I encourage you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C seminars, seminar series, apologies. Um, now, as I mentioned, the series was launched by Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman, who leads ASME's Engineering Global Development Research Committee. Uh, Jesse is a system professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT and also holds an SM in mechanical engineering and a BS in ocean engineering from MIT. Uh, prior to his academic career, he worked as a development engineer in Peru, working with rural communities on alternative business opportunities and with local, local doctors groups on medical device development. He also, uh, cut his teeth as a teacher, a math teacher in Boston. Um, so he is a multifaceted as they come. Uh, so he's currently the director of the Global Design Laboratory at University of Michigan, uh, focusing on developing design processes and support tools to help multidisciplinary design teams think at a systems level when performing complex systems design tasks. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, technologists, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved ag uh, agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, a prior art database of more than 1,000 essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events, such as the one we are having today, and access to resources online to their interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted annually by Engineering for Change Research Fellows on behalf of our partners and sponsors and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. 
We invite you to visit our research page. The, uh, the URL is listed on this slide to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review of the State of Engineering for Global Development, which is a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in this emerging sector. If you have a research question or want to work with us on a research project as a fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. Now, as I mentioned at the top of this webinar, we are hosting this in collaboration with Conservation Lights Labs and the Artisanal Mining Grand Challenge. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a challenge that is happening right now, focusing on accelerating solutions for people and the planet. There are over a million dollars in prizes for winners and solutions are being actively sought out around the world. The challenge is focused specifically on the Amazon. And this is a global call for innovators, researchers, and entrepreneurs from all over the world to develop and implement solutions that address the environmental and social costs of artisanal and small scale gold mining in the Amazon. Uh, in particular, uh, we are seeking applicants from, and I should also have this in Espanol, um, the Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Guyana, and Suriname. So uh, the closing date is uh, November 10th. So please visit the URL listed on this slide uh, to register to get more information and learn more about how to apply for this really important challenge. Um, and you'll hear why this is so important through the context of our speakers today. Now, we're so thrilled to welcome everyone today and, and learn a little bit more about where you are. I know you're all experts in Zoom since the pandemic has forced all of us to meet here, but we're going to take a moment to uh, meet you and practice a little bit uh, on the platform. So please use the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, to type in the location from which you're joining us today. I'll start. Uh, I am joining you all from Brooklyn, New York today. If the chat is not open on your screen, try to clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. So welcome from South Carolina to Chicago, uh, Washington DC to Malawi, Omaha, Nebraska to New Jersey, uh, Isiquito, Colombia, Princeton. Welcome everyone. We're so thrilled to have you with us from Arlington to Bogota, uh, South Carolina, lots of South Carolina joining us today, uh, LA and Chia, Colombia, brilliant. So thrilled to have you. Do keep adding your uh, locations there. Please note that uh, we would like for you to uh, maintain uh, your questions. Um, use Put them into the Q&A window uh, versus uh, the chat. Uh, those will be collated for our speakers to ensure we don't miss anything. If you have any technical questions or uh, need to address some key points, just send a private cha chat to the Engineering for Change admin. Um, all right, I think those are all the instructions and again, welcome everyone. With that, I am so thrilled to now introduce our incredible speakers, starting with Dr. Irene Velez Torres, who is a full professor at the University of Valle. She obtained her PhD in human political geography from the University of Copenhagen after having studied philosophy and cultural studies at the University Universidad Nacional de Colombia. She has been a visiting scholar at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague and at the Loughborough University in the UK. Her region of interest in Latin America and its local connections, Colombia in particular, where she works on the critical analysis of rural conflicts, social and environmental inequity, um, and issues of racial and ethnic inequality. She considers participatory and interdisciplinary methodologies of crucial importance in order to create knowledge that is valuable for the communities as well as for academia. And we couldn't agree more on that particular point. She is joined today by Dr. Diana Venegas, who earned her PhD and master's in agricultural and biological engineering at the University of Florida. Prior to that, she received a degree in food engineering from the Universidad del Valle in Colombia. While her research is mostly focused on biosensors development, she has many other areas of expertise, including electrochemical detection, electrochemical analysis, voltometry, cyclic voltometry, electroanalytical chemistry, self-assembled monolayers. I'm not going to go through all of these. There are many, 
uh, very diverse uh, technical expertise. She joined Clemson in 2019. Dr. Vanegas is interested in engineering solutions to technological challenges related to food and agriculture in settings of low resource and marginalization. She's also focused on integration and adapting technologies to support sustainable food systems. And her program spans the United States, Colombia, and China. Again, really incredible expertise here. Last but not least, they'll be joined by Luis Fernandez, who is the executive director of Wake Forest University Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, a research initiative that examines the impacts of artisanal gold mining, mercury contamination, and deforestation in the Peruvian Amazon. Luis is also a research associate professor in the Department of Biology and a fellow at Wake Forest University Center for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability. He's trained as a tropical ecologist. He's an, an expert on the environmental impacts of artisanal scale mining and mining related environmental mercury contamination. He has held professional positions at Stanford University, Carnegie Institution for Science, the US EPA, Argonne National Laboratory, and the University of Michigan, and has led major research efforts in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Madagascar. So, wow, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Bienvenido, uh, over to you, uh, Diana. Or Irene, I'm not sure who's starting. Yeah, it is this time, but um, we're going to share the screen. Well, thank you very much for uh, this invitation. It is a real pleasure to be sharing with you uh, some of the results that we have uh, reached throughout our transdisciplinary research project that we have developed over the five, last five years. Um, uh, I... Oh, uh, artisanal gold mining in Colombia is not very different from all the contexts in the global south. Particularly, it shares a lot of similarities with Peru and Brazil in Latin America, but also with Ghana or Congo in Africa. Uh, what could be similar is, for example, the lack of formality, but also the use of some uh, very dangerous pollutants so, such as mercury and uh, cyanide. 23% uh, of the municipalities in Colombia have some sort of artisanal gold mining. And because of the lack of formalization in 2019, the national government attempted to formalize the sector. However, only reaching 2% of um, artisanal gold mining formalization, which is very low and challenges uh, extremely um, the possibilities to trace the uh, consequences and social impacts of artisanal gold mining. Um, artisanal gold mining is the activity that releases the most mercury to the atmosphere. Uh, at a global scale, more or less 38% of the total emissions come from artisanal gold mining. And Colombia is the third biggest uh, mercury releaser, but also the first one if we count the per capita pollution that we generate. Uh, in the last two decades, Colombia has had an import rate of mercury that uh, goes more or less uh, between uh, 130 and 133 tons of mercury legally imported. However, some of the scholars think that the real rates of mercury that is circulating in the Colombian environment can be close to 200 tons per year. This number has, however, dropped uh, in the last two years, but it is very... Um, uh, like polemic, the reason why the number is now so low as two tons per year. Traditional gold mining, it's a mercury free activity that is different from artisanal gold mining. In Colombia, traditional gold mining is uh, mostly uh, done by ethnic communities who have for, for over centuries uh, extracted gold uh, using very rudimentary and clean technologies. 
but in the last one or two decades, the use of mercury has increased and therefore the traditional mining has been pushed away from social and ecological uh, relationships. We are in this context looking at one particular territory, La Toma, uh, located at the southwest of Colombia. Uh, La Toma is a mining uh, community. Uh, it's a rural area uh, located in a very conflictive uh, zone of Colombia. Uh, the community has more or less 7,000 inhabitants that uh, occupy more or less seven uh, square kilometers. 92% of this community self-identifies as Afro-descendants, which in Colombia is very relevant because since the constitution of 1991, uh, ethnic communities have uh, special rights. And one of the rights, or, or some of them, uh, refer to the control that the communities can have over the resources and the governance in their territories. 52% of this community uh, says that their main economic activity is traditional gold mining. So it has a very important social and cultural um, relevance for the community. Uh, five years ago, this community saw something happening in the Ovejas River, which is the one that you see in this picture, which was the uh, a lot of fish being dead in the river. These are a, this is a traditionally a fishing community. So they were like devastated, but also very worried. And they called the university to try to make sense of what was going on there. And since then we are uh, pursuing this um, research objective of understanding what is the status, what is the level of contamination that the territory has and how it can be impacting uh, human health. But we don't only uh, want to assess the level of contamination, but also to build knowledge that can be useful for the community and that can help them to make sense of what is going on over there, but to make changes, local changes that could improve the environmental governance in the territory. So we are doing th this uh, um, project uh, with an, a transdisciplinary approach that basically combines qualitative uh, social research methods with a uh, quantitative engineering methods and the most relevant of this uh, strategy is the participation of the community, not only as informants, but as really a, a participants and like uh, people that can make changes. No? That's our like point of departure. So this is one of the examples uh, of how the communities participate in the project. We, um, from the social science, we uh, proposed a, a method, which is social cartography. So with that method, what we want to do is to understand what could be the connections between the water sources that the community uses uh, for uh, water consumption, for local water consumption, and what could be the uh, places where the mercury is being released. Uh, so we do this um, cartography and with the community, we prioritize what could be the places that are more vulnerable or that can generate more impact to the community. For example, we, uh, through the knowledge of the community, we could understand that the school, the local school, were, was a, an important place to research because even though we couldn't see a, a mine close by, it is a place where at least 20, 200 uh, children are consuming water in an everyday basis. So from that information, we uh, prioritize some sampling sites. And uh, this is what uh, where the engineers come to help us in uh, pursuing the research. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to expand too much uh, on the faith and transport of mercury in the context of artisanal oil mining. Uh, but what I want to point out is that um, 
Mercury is involved in several steps of the process uh, of our artisanal mining in, in, in La Toma. Uh, and this is challenging. My part of the project is uh, my little piece is just the monitoring of the pollutant in, in water, right? And there's uh, several sources, putative sources of mercury contamination in the water that the community uses. Now, again, this is a rural community that doesn't have access to aqueduct or any kind of uh, clean water infrastructure and sanitation infrastructure. So whatever is in the water is going to impact them directly because they consume it as such. Now, mercury is a very uh, tricky pollutant because it can speciate depending on the environmental conditions. So what I will say is that in the water, we can have both ionic mercury and metal mercury, which is the most um, dangerous form of mercury. Um, so from that, we find different uh, environmental engineering needs um, and the challenges associating, associated with the um, monitoring the pollutant uh, were like one of the reasons why it was so important that we team up uh, with the community and made them participants of the research, um, not, not just, you know, subjects of research or, or recipients of knowledge, but they really needed to help us. One of the reasons is this is a conflict zone. So in the context of the armed conflict in Colombia is not very safe to just go to a rural place and start collecting samples. So this is one of the ways in which we collaborated with them. Uh, they really let us know what days were safe to go to the territory. And then because uh, the pandemic started as we were like in the middle of this process, um, we ended up training community members to be able to do the sampling um, themselves in the territory. And then they, they ship the samples to the university in the city of Cali. Uh, now, for in terms of in situ monitoring, there's a lot of complexity and limitations. For example, there's not electric grid access, communication uh, and transportation is also very difficult. There's no you know, cell phone towers, all of that. So it's, it's uh, really hard to bring technology there to do work. Um, and then the, the last thing that I want to mention is laboratory analysis are very expensive. For mercury, for example, we usually use atomic absorption and spectroscopy as the standard technique for the assessing mercury levels. Um, we don't have that easily accessible in, in the region. So the, the cost of this monitoring is a real factor. Uh, and this is one of the needs that we're trying to tackle now. I'm going to show a little bit about how we're doing that. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to jump real quick to some water pollution results that we collected last year. So on the left side, uh, we have just the, the mercury uh, concentration levels in 10 different um, sampling points were, which were decided using the methodology that Irene described. So what I want you to see here is just, if you look at the red dots, those are the average concentration for each site. And each site was sampled in three different um, dates, right? And so the, the red dotted line is just the threshold that is established by the World Health Organization for drinking water. Now, this is really environmental water. This is not, you know, the standard drinking water that we engineers, you know, can think of that has been uh, treated in a um, water treatment facility. This is just environmental water, but again, because this community does not have access to that infrastructure, they consume the water directly and use it. So it's kind of tricky to use these levels um, in this way. But then the, the, the next, the solid red line indicates the threshold established by the EPA here in the United States. And, and also uh, Colombian regulations use the same thresholds as the EPA. So what I will say here is that some of the points uh, around, this is what the graph next to it is trying to show. Some of the points, like half of them were above the average of all points 
uh, but most of them were like below the regulatory thresholds. Um, however, one consideration to have, which we later analyzed this using risk assessment uh, with our partners at the University of Florida, is that uh, it's kind of tricky because the, the community doesn't leave the place. They are basically chronically exposed to low levels of mercury uh, and have been for about uh, two decades now. So the impacts can be um, really significant if, if you consider you know, that, that time of exposure. And then um, the, the, in this particular site, this um, little village is located on the hillside. Uh, so we found a, an interesting correlation between the sampling date uh, and the mercury levels in water uh, for consumption. And this is, uh, we think is associated with uh, actually weather because in the first, the first time we went sampling, there was a lot of rain. So we think that runoff was a factor, the runoff of, of mercury from the soil and from the places where they stored the uh, the ores that have been already treated with mercury and cyanide. Um, then the second time we went, there was also some rain, but not as much. And then the third time it was completely dry. the dry season. Um, so, and this is on the hillside, which makes uh, sense. It means probably that up, upstream there's mercury um, pollution sources. This is another uh, location in the same region but this community is on top of the mountain. So here we don't see that correlation with the, with the date of, of the sampling. Uh, however, what I will point out is that there were more uh, sampling sites in that location that were above the threshold established by the World Health Organization. Uh, and also I will say um, that that makes sense because um, and the average, um, you know, the, the average of um, concentration of mercury in all sampling sites was higher than in the first uh, area that we visited. That makes sense because this area here is where the mercury is used the most in the burning process uh, to separate the gold from the from the mercury, the amalgam. Uh, so. We then explain these results. We try to do it as, as quickly as we can um, to the community. So not just to ourselves, but we need to uh, be ready to tell the community what's going on. And this is one of the cartoons that we made to explain. After we ran the data through the risk assessment uh, models, uh, we explained to them, okay, so if we look at age groups really like there's a high risk of impact on um, babies. And this is just um, associated probably with the body size. Um, and then infants, about 25% of the infants uh, will be affected, uh, children in school age, and then the least affected will be the adults. And that made sense um, because some of the adults, particularly the minors, the male minors that work with mercury were kind of hesitant in, you know, with this um, uh, explanation of, of the problematic of using mercury. However, the women were very, um, felt very validated because in their community, they're the ones in charge of taking care of small children and the elderly, which are the people that are experiencing already uh, health problems that they didn't see before the introduction of mercury. Uh, in terms of uh, development of technology, we're now in the lab working on the development of low cost sensors, electrochemical and optical sensors using um, materials that can be um, found, like purchased easily in Colombia. So our idea is to be able to bring uh, and, and help the technology be appropriated and, and fully developed in Colombia and be used um, uh, with the university in association with the communities. So I'm not going to expand too much on how the sensors work for the same sake of time, but if anyone has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or maybe we can ask, uh, talk about it later. Um, 
Again, like I said, it's very important for us to deliver the, what uh, we learn to both the uh, scientific community and, but also give it back to the, the community um, that is affected uh, the most. So that requires some you know, translation from all of the academic lingo into something that people can understand better. So I'm not going to expand on the papers that we publish on this because, um, yeah, I, I, what I will say is we do it. We also present in conferences, um, but I'm going to pass it on to Irene because I think this is very important, interesting for um, how to also bring this knowledge back to the community. Uh, well, so as it was the interest of the community, what motivated us in the first place to go and uh, try to make sense of this contamination in Latoma, it is also our commitment to go back to them and to try to reinforce what could be solutions and how can we learn from these uh, five years of uh, research. So we are doing this in uh, through several uh, communication and pedagogical strategies. Uh, one thing that we have been doing for the last year is to develop virtual learning materials. It actually, we created the project before COVID times, but when COVID was there, then it was just the perfect strategy to think of. This community, as Diana said, is uh, disconnected from electricity and from internet. So we are developing materials that can be used in computers without any connectivity. And uh, the idea is that in secondary, the teachers can deliver these materials to the students and the students can explore it and learn at the same time content that they will usually learn uh, in a normal chemistry class or biology class, but that they do it in relation to the problem of mercury contamination. We are also producing podcasts, but we are trying to go against the usual top-down uh, methodology. So what we are doing is to um, make um, radio, radio programs with the community members to try to make sense with them and in their own language of what's going on in the territory. And we are organizing that material in order to reproduce it and distribute it in more than 40 local radio stations from the region. We have also produced some videos to introduce what are the objectives of the project. And now we are working on our final video to uh, also disseminate some of the most important results. And we have a website that you are very welcome to visit and social media. Uh, this project hasn't finished. We hope to continue uh, doing things at this moment in particular. We are finalizing the health assessment in La Toma and Jolombo. We are going to be analyzing these results in relation to the uh, water quality analysis and some fish sampling that we have also done uh, last year. Uh, the 3rd of September and 10th of September, we are organizing two dissemination seminars. So you are very welcome to participate. It's going to be in Spanish, but going to have uh, English uh, simultaneous translation. So if you are interested, please write down your email and we will contact you um, for that participation. And we are going to disseminate results again by the end of this year to local communities and local governmental organizations, if interested, because that's that has been one of the biggest challenges in this research, which is basically like the difficulty to engage with authorities. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. And we are here uh, happy to hear your questions. So I believe now we're going to transition to Luis. Thank you so much, Diana, Irene. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, and congratulations to the team and my colleagues in uh, Colombia. Really important work. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation now, and uh, just give me a second here. Just want to confirm that things are looking good. Looking great. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, 
So um, my name is Luis Fernandez, and I am a research professor at Wake Forest University and also the executive director uh, of the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about, well, let me tell you about what the goal for my uh, talk with you today is. One is to give you um, an overview of uh, the issue of artisanal gold mining in the Amazon, how that connects gold with the destruction of rainforests and mercury contamination of entire uh, ecosystems in not just the Amazon, but many tropical areas around the world, how that's connected to gold, which is something that I think we all consume, not only in jewelry, but also in our cell phones, uh, in the production of uh, electronics uh, switches and, and, and part of our lives, um, but also uh, the role of uh, how innovation can help uh, understand the weight of that demand and uh, how, well, you could be part of the solution for many of the problems that exist um, through uh, individual action, but also as being part of initiatives uh, such as um, the uh, many of the uh, work to create challenges and prizes to generate uh, interest and, uh, and action for developing uh, real solutions that could be applicable in, in over 80 countries around the world. So let me start my presentation. Uh, and this is meant to, I think, uh, intrigue you. Uh, and hopefully you'll find this uh, interesting. And I'll also be discussing about the work that, that Cynthia is doing, which is this research center that we've created in Peru in partnership with Wake Forest University and uh, USAID, the US Agency for in, uh, International Development. Uh, for addressing much of these issues uh, to generate solutions. So what we're looking at here is, is a piece of gold. Uh, and this is what gold looks like when it's artisanally mined. Um, and much of the question is like, how much does that gold cost? Uh, and I don't mean in economic terms, but what is the, what is the cost of forests? Um, what is the cost of watersheds? Um, what is the cost of biodiversity? Um, and, and how um, this activity transforms pristine rainforest areas like you see here to landscapes that are highly transformed. Um, this was a small creek um, that, going on, uh, that was maybe about 25 kilometers long and now essentially it looks like um, a forest. And we're gonna examine what this is and, and what this image represents uh, in places uh, like the Amazon. Um, so ASGM is the acronym for artisanal small-scale gold mining. Uh, and there's mainly, uh, a, there's two things that you should take away from the slide. One is that there's four general regions that it's uh, a, typically seen in Latin America. Colombia, where my colleagues just presented, uh, the Guiana Shield, this is the central Amazon, and this is the Andes Amazon region uh, where I work. And it is the grow fastest growing hotspot and currently the largest hotspot in Amazonia for ASGM. Um, the, the place that we I'm not sure if we're seeing Luis paused. I think we've lost Luis. Luis, can you hear us? If, uh, if we um, have Luis drop off uh, or and return, Marilyn, if you can just check in with him, we can consider taking um, a targeted question for Diana or Irene while we wait for his return. Sure. Um, so uh, Diana and Irene, um, thanks. First of all, for, for the, uh, the, the amazing information and presentation, just amazing transdisciplinary, I think was really important, sort of the breadth of the approaches you're bringing to the one problem. One of the things that I thought was interesting, and we have a question here about it. Um, so, you know, in my previous work, when we were looking at sort of these public health impacts of different technology interventions, um, we have to look at different pathways that this pollution happens. So, you know, you just heard Louise talking about forest, biodiversity, all these different things. Even if we're just looking at the health impacts that you guys were studying, um, how did you talk to the community or look into what are all the different ways, the potential ways 
in which mercury could be affecting the population. I know you talked about the risk models, um, but you're doing a lot of water sampling and you know, someone brought up soil, but there's other ways in which uh, pollutants and not only mercury can, can get into uh, the, the population and, and cause health problems. So how did you guys approach that and discuss with the community about, hey, your expectations might be that it's water or that it's soil or something else. And this is why we're focusing on that. Um, so sort of just talk about the different pathways that you guys have. Okay, well, I'm gonna respond real quick because I see uh, Luis is back, <laughs> but um, just to clarify. So there's um, several considerations. Well, one is that uh, the community's concern, which is what triggered the project, uh, was the water because they were um, one of the complementary livelihoods is, is fishing and they saw all of these dead fish. So they really wanted to know what was happening in the water. Now, coincidentally, like you mentioned, there's a lot of potential routes of exposure to mercury. You can have exposure via air from the inhalation of the vapors when they are doing uh, the burning of the amalgam. Um, but uh, that's one that will affect mostly the miners involved in the process. However, the water, because the water is consumed directly from the environmental source by all of the community, um, was a, a very important concern. I know the risk models that look at health impacts also include health, um, sorry, soil. Uh, in, Curiously enough, soil consumption is, is part of some of the models, especially, I guess, small children can um, be exposed in that way. Um, but uh, we, we thought, well, in terms of um, our possibilities um, of work and also considering the limitations, um, because the research was very expensive and, and at the beginning, we didn't have that much funding to work with. Uh, we just uh, went with water first, and then we moved actually to look at the concentration of mercury in fish that is used um, by the community because they also fish from, from those rivers and they consume fish daily. So that's another uh, source of exposure of methyl mercury, which is the most uh, toxic form of mercury. And yeah, I hope that uh, we are able to gather more uh, sources, more funding to be able to look at all of the other pathways that contribute to that problem. But um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yes. Oh no, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, I have some follow-up. So I have lots of questions about this. Just as a background, I did a project on e-waste recycling uh, in Thailand, we were dealing with a lot of the similar things, heavy metals, what are the different pathways? Um, one of the things that I wanna bring up and, and someone just posted a question to the, about the desafios, you know, the challenges that you have, uh, uh, particularly, I think, um, looking at the community and, and communicating in a, real, in a real way, the results of the work that you're doing. So you're saying it's triggered by the community we're, we're doing this project, but then we got to give you the results because you want to use it to make decisions about your life, right? Like, how can we improve this situation? And so I know you mentioned it seemed really exciting. You talked about uh, radio programs. Um, I know from my work in Peru that like the radio was one of the main ways people got information. So I think that that was, that sounds really exciting. Um, can you talk about how you maybe got to that, to that method, but also you're doing all this sort of multifaceted sort of content creation, right? To be able to, to get to people in different ways. And I wonder what were some of the challenges that you guys have in terms of like, okay, great, we will, well, let's make a radio program, but it seems like there's probably a lot there that it's not easy, right? So what are some of the challenges that you think you might see if you were advising me to try and work with a community similarly in a different part of the world, what would you be looking at? What was your experience of, what are the main challenges to doing that type of communication? Uh, thank you for the question. It's super interesting. It's it's usually difficult to trace back how did you have an idea, no? But basically, what we have been doing is trying several things, and by trying and sometimes succeeding and some other times not succeeding so well, then we have decided different paths. So what we are doing now is first of all to target young 
the, the young the youngsters. So because we we have seen through like social methods and very ethnographic approach to the mining settings that the population that is using mercury the most are the new generations. The old generations are defending the traditional uh, mining uh, free of mercury. So we thought, okay, now we have to focus on this um, uh, this community, this uh, sector of the community. How do we do that? Well, the school, every uh, all the children in the in the region have to go to school, but let's not making make it boring because they don't like to go to school. So let's make something that could be interesting. We have a, like the most important challenge there was the lack of a internet connection. So we thought about doing some, something virtual like a video game at the beginning. Later, we thought about an app. And even though they have cell phones, the technology uh, of the cell phones cannot carry an app. So we dropped that idea and we finally got to this one, which is like a like like yeah like a presentation that moves on its own and that doesn't need internet connection and we have done that development with designers that uh, can translate these needs and like really take the opportunity to have some developments in that uh, perspective as, as well uh, I lived in the territory for over a year when I was doing my PhD, so I know that uh, not having internet and not having TV connection or not even a TV device, then radio becomes super relevant for entertaining. So what I thought was like, it's super cool if we can, for example, mix local music with some news about Mercury. And we developed and local that voices too, right? Yeah, because they they also participate in the production. So there's voices that they can recognize as people from the community talking about this. So it's very exciting for them. Yeah. So what we did then was to uh, interview some of the people that were already participating in the project, uh, some of the social leaders that are recognized and like looked up by the youngsters. And uh, we, with them, we made these uh, radio programs. But we saw the opportunity of expanding uh, the impact of the programs. So now we are looking at other municipalities in the region, in the Cauca region, where there is also gold mining and where they can use this same information that we've learned and produced to also yeah, reflect on them. That's, that's really amazing and inspiring stuff and I'm seeing already some some chats and some some comments like hey we want to use the same type of approach uh so very exciting to hear about that work I believe that we have uh Luis you're back on the line uh, so I think we're going to present your slides uh for you and then and then you're going to speak to us uh perhaps through another uh mode of mode of internet uh you know we're just talking about internet connectivity questions so maybe next month we'll do a radio show I don't know we'll, we'll look into it <laughs> I uh, hear it's very okay. successful, um, but Luis, please take it away. And, and I think okay. you were at the hot spots. You were talking about where where uh, you're, you guys are working. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And apologies, uh, believe it or not, I'm in San Francisco in the center of technology and uh, my internet went down. So I'm doing this through my cell signal. Um, so again, apologies. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to sync my presentation to see what we're doing. Um, I actually may uh, ask to skip forward a few slides, uh, but I will uh, let you know uh, so we can uh, take it full advantage of the time. So uh, these are the hotspots where we're uh, where ASGM works. So uh, please advance to the next slide. Okay, next slide, please. Mylene, next slide, please. Do you see the slides moving or? No, 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 we don't. This is a very exciting, exciting seminar for us today. <laughs> it's troubleshooting across multiple time zones. There we go. All right. Okay. So, so uh, yes. Okay. So that's that's great. So uh, we work in Madre de Dios. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so it's on the triple border between Peru, Brazil, and uh, Bolivia. Next slide, please. 
This is a very rudimentary technology. What you're seeing here is a sluice made of materials uh, from the forest that it's cut from. Next slide. Um, and, and basically, these are folks that are just finding jobs uh, from other areas of Peru. Next slide. And, and they work in very rudimentary conditions. This is a sluice uh, and some of the gravel pits that are uh, uh, created in the activity. Next slide, please. They use high pressure water hoses to blast out riverbanks um, and then process the slurry that's created through these sluices to concentrate gold flex uh, in the sediments found at the bottom of rivers. Next, they do use mercury. Uh, as mentioned before, this is uh, illicitly uh, sourced and used. Next slide, please. And it's used, of course, in conditions that are not optimal for the handling of such a dangerous mercury. Uh, I mean, uh, um, um, product. Uh, so what you're seeing here are amalgams. Um, and uh, I'll ask to slow down the slides, please. Um, so amalgams are mercury and gold. What you see here is a person holding a 50% 50, uh, mercury, a 50% uh, gold ball. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, please go ahead to the next slide. Um, so what you see here basically is the final product of that. Next slide, please. Um, actually, uh, let's pass these videos. I think they're just going to take too much time at this point. Um, next slide, please. Go past this video. Okay. So, okay, yeah. Um, so that you can hold there. So Cynthia, uh, if you could just click one slide, there's a small animation here. Um, what we do is we focus on several aspects of the, of the problem, reforestation, mercury in the environment, uh, the use of artificial intelligence for analyzing satellite and drone data, policy intelligence and education. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the type of questions that uh, we're, we're interested in asking. Um, so uh, essentially, what kind of landscape damage is done by artisanal scale gold mining? How does this compare for impacts on other drivers? And what is unknown about ASGM? And of course, what tools can we apply to develop, uh, to, to develop the reduction of these, uh, these impacts and characterize them better? And in the future, what are the problems that are waiting for us in a climate uncertain future? Uh, next slide, please. Um, in Madre de Dios, this is an area that in the last 10 years has suffered about um, 150,000 hectares of loss, uh, which by 370,000 uh, acres. Uh, next slide. We may have lost Luis again, but if I'm gathering from uh, what is written on the slide, there is uh, significant reforestation and remediation uh, ongoing with um, testing of various native Amazonian trees. Luis, I'm reading exactly what is on the slide on your behalf. Oh, can, can you hear me? We can now. Okay. I'm sorry for the connectivity. Um, so we, we uh, are doing reforestation of these areas. So we work with, uh, with uh, engineer, forest engineers and other specialists to, to uh, test uh, over 70 species of native Amazonian uh, trees uh, for reforesting these areas. Next slide, please. We also uh, basically uh, reverse, uh, well, uh, kind of downscale engineer uh, biochar reactors to create ways to inject carbon into the soil, both for, for carbon sequestration, but also for potential uh, uh, use in uh, heavy metal uh, attenuation in soils. Um, and this is using waste biomass. So what you see here are basically the way that we can use um, agricultural waste to generate carbon that helps the trees grow better and potentially uh, protect them from mercury contamination. Um, we can, uh, this is an area also that has a lot of uh, transformation of landscapes. So uh, next slide, please. Um, we use drones. Um, next slide. 
where we custom built drones. We have different platforms, uh, both fixed wing and rotors to, uh, with a series of sensors. Uh, and this is under a laboratory in North Carolina. Next slide, please. Um, this is a small video that's just showing one of our uh, uh, drones taking off uh, and starting to patrol automatically one of the areas. Uh, basically, it'll have a 60 kilometer flight plan and capture images uh, in, the, uh, in the area. Next slide, please. And these yellow lines are essentially tracks um, that we use for monitoring places like La Pampa, which is one of the largest mining sites. Um, and next slide. And, and that allows us to recreate in combination uh, in, in, with not just the drone imagery, but satellite imagery uh, combining uh, to recreate the history of mining. This is 35 years of mining, uh, illegal mining in the, in the region. This is something published in 2018. Um, the next slide, but also in combining sensors of different resolutions, uh, we can get a lot more. Next slide. We have a team that focuses on using convolutional neural nets. Uh, this is basically machine learning for processing much of the, uh, the imagery that we have, because no longer do we have a data problem, we have a data analysis problem, where we're trying to convert data into information for better use. Next slide. This essentially allows us to do facial recognition. So right now in this image, we see not only just uh, deforestation areas, but we find tents and sluices and dredges and hoses and all kinds of mining equipment. Next slide. And what we're looking for is the ability to essentially do something like facial recognition. Uh, so next slide, where we can then uh, find the pieces of machinery on the landscape that tell us whether deforestation is either happening now or will in the short future. Next slide. So um, this will supercharge our ability to be able to do this since we will be able to do this processing automatically in the cloud using some of the high resolution satellite imagery that is being available, uh, made available daily. This allows us to also find dark mining. And this is important for mercury contamination uh, in areas because uh, this is mining that is not currently easily found. And it is something that we can, uh, next slide please that we can use uh, that may be uh, uh, up to 10% of areas that are currently not being detected. Next slide. You can just move to the next slide. And, and uh, uh, we, can find, we can use the, uh, the neural nets to determine what these are, because these are areas that are not only transformed in terms of beaches, but potentially reworked. Uh, where mercury releases are happening in these areas. And this is, and this actually points to another uh, thing too, that uh, mercury contamination is really driven in areas uh, of transformation where forests are literally turned to, far, uh, uh, forests are literally turned to water. Next slide, please. So 30% of the deforested land are converted to mining ponds and that's where mercury concentrates. Next slide, please. Um, we use uh, radar imagery uh, to detect the, the complexity of the, the, the mining ponds. Next slide. And we find that up to 30% of the, of the areas that are being deforested are essentially being lost, that these trees will never grow back because they have no more soils to grow on. So essentially, this is uh, the creation of these, uh, these um, wetlands. This was something that was reported on by NASA uh, uh, from the International Space Station that actually saw this. Um, so this was a story back in uh, March. Next slide. Um, and really, it does actually create like this is the, the, the new hydroscape that defines what mercury releases are in, in certain parts of the Amazon. Next slide, please. Um, in this area, mer mercury is being released at about a rate of 185 tons per year, just in this region. So it's a tremendous amount of mercury. To be able to analyze this, um, we've um, uh, we've created uh, the first mercury laboratory in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, so we have a DMA, which is a, a, a direct mercury analyzer, and we do all the processing there in the in Madre de Dios in the in the, in the field forward site. Next. Next. Um, we also have a very um, 
robust uh, research field program where we uh, do measurements of the entire uh, food chain. So we're doing plankton, macroinvertebrates, sediments, soils, water, fish, and, and, and also people working uh, in native communities. Um, and some of these communities are very, very remote and uh, in our very pristine areas. So next slide, please. To be able to get the uh, measurements, we use a range of traditional techniques and, and more novel techniques. Next slide, please. Where we take soil cores and sediment samples at the bottom of these rivers. You're, uh, they're pulling uh, some sediment cores, but we're also working with local universities and, uh, for the use of uh, not just drones in the air, but also drones on the water. And here there's one of the drones being put in one of the mining ponds. Next slide, please. To be able to take bathymetric temperatures, but all uh, uh, no, measurements, but also uh, start to take samples that could be used for mercury uh, analysis. And this is one of the papers that we had in Science Advances just last year, talking about how these artificial lakes are, are really driving the pollution in, in many of these water, uh, of these ecosystems. Next slide, please. Um, mercury in air is also a very big problem because it actually not only gets locally deposited in soils, but also in trees and in urban areas. Next slide, please. So we've worked with partners uh, to create, to basically do this kind of downscale uh, cost-effective sampling. Next slide, please. Because we need to know about mercury hotspots. So we worked with the University of Toronto to, to help deploy uh, this passive air samplers where we're using just simple small mercury, I mean, small plastic um, jars essentially that have a sorbent and, and particular diffusive uh, barriers that allow diffusion rates at a, a very known temperature and some specialized sorbent, next slide, and, and deployed them in very creative ways, both in natural areas, next slide, and in urban areas. Um, and this is easier said than done. Um, and, and put them in urban areas, for example, here in the city of Puerto Maldonado, the capital of the region, next slide, please, to create um, hotspot maps based on empirical measurements at different concentrations. And this allows us to see uh, where the mercury is. Um, this is actually on a transect which is about 200 kilometers long, so it can be used at very fine scale, but also a very large scale to understand how this is being distributed through a region and also detect areas that are clandestine. So it can be kind of a discovery technique about where there's illicit uh, um, releases of mercury uh, across the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, um, how this affects people is part of the work as well. This is uh, with the Machaginga community in Manu National Park, an area that is far away from the mining zone, but has mercury uh, issues of mercury contamination. Next slide, please. And in this case, uh, we're not only testing soil sediments and, and food, fish that they eat, but also testing mercury uh, in their hair. And hair is a, is a really good biomarker for methylmercury, which is the type of mercury that you get from consumption. Um, so now just to kind of wrap up, what are the questions that we need to answer next? Um, many of them related are also related to wildfires. Um, next slide, please. The, this part of the Amazon, the Western Amazon is drying out. Uh, basically, it's one of the areas that will suffer increased temperatures and lower humidities uh, and because, because of climate change. And that means that there's an increased in, uh, incidence of wildfires. Uh, actually, my, my co-PI on this project says presenting on, uh, on fires in the Amazon right now. Uh, and uh, so there is that, the, the, a distinct possibility of increased carbon and mercury releases due to these wildfires. So what does this mean? And, and what does the scale up order? Uh, next slide, please. Um, and also do um, ASGM impacts change, next slide, with the type of mining. What you see here is hydraulic mining, which is kind of a low tech kind of mining, but there's also a technification of mining. If you can go back for just a slide, please. Yeah, so this is actually the use of heavy machinery, basically front loaders and bulldozers to do the mining. So what does that mean? Because they're still using mercury, so that, that release pattern is gonna be very different. So it's also an engineering question, not only from a kind of a hydrological engineering, but also mining engineering, and then uh, in, the, in the way that mercury will propagate through the ecosystem. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of wildlife, how will wildlife return to these areas and how can wildlife be useful for natural regeneration of forests and for the recovery uh, or the evolution of these uh, aquatic ecosystems. 
Um, we take a look at birds and bats as bioindicators because we can't have enough sensors essentially to put down in the, in the landscape. So next slide. We find that some species have higher uh, uh, ability to absorb mercury and reflect what the mercury levels are in those areas. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, in terms of policy, what's really important is like, what are the effects of social interventions on mining impacts and, and mercury uh, and deforestation? So some are uh, related to police actions. And of course, COVID is the big factor that's affecting everything. So, you know, how are things uh, being affected? We need the ability to understand that. Next slide, please. Um, so again, these problems is that we have high rates of deforestation, we have widespread mercury contamination, we have soil quality and carbon loss, we have the inability really to produce scientifically robust data in many of these areas, and we have low awareness and understanding, particularly for vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. And so we have a lot of tasks that I think that engineers like yourselves can help. Uh, and so one is provide scientific evidence for innovations, right? And this is important for decision-making. It's a common trope, but it's important um, that we have quality information if you want quality result, uh, uh, um, uh, decisions to be made. And we need to increase the capacity of local scientists, technologists, and institutions, and also develop the tools for governance because the tools of governance is just not policy, but it's also the ability to generate uh, uh, robust data and to take uh, evidence-based uh, decisions. Um, so this is useful for educating the public decision makers that currently have a limited capacity experience for consuming this sort of information. And this goes to protecting vulnerable uh, forest dwelling groups such as indigenous communities. Um, so the opportunity for, for engaging with that really is kind of like built into the idea of the artisanal mining grand challenge. Um, and this is the one that's focused on the Amazon. There was a first round uh, of the artisanal mining challenge. Uh, and this was, and that's a global one. Now this is just focused on the Amazon. There's a million dollars in prizes for breakthrough innovations to, to improve the, the outcome, uh, environmental outcome for ASGM. So the idea really is to provide the incentive for uh, solution makers to engage, uh, uh, not just from Latin America, but for Latin America, uh, for the Amazon. And there are four sub-challenges, right? Um, there is safeguarding the ecosystems, everything related to uh, environmental uh, outcomes. Um, the, uh, the, the other ones are related to the idea that uh, uh, there is optimizing the responsible supply chains. So it's the way that technology and, and, and engineering solutions can be used to, to make uh, the, the supply chain for gold more transparent, more responsible, and tying the data that's collected in the field to what is uh, essentially used for providing uh, economic uh, bonus of value that would be passed on to uh, consumers for gold, the, the buyers, you know, whether it's a gold buyer in London or somebody buying a ring in a local mall in Indiana. Um, and, the, and the other one is uh, promoting sustaining reformalization. So this is basically how to support regulation in, in many of the countries, in the eight countries that, uh, that have this issue in, uh, in, in the Amazon. Um, it, much of this uh, uh, is illegal or illicit, so effective regulation is gonna be key for maintaining these markets standing and being effective. So how can we leverage technology innovation to be able to support uh, essentially the, the modern regulation of this huge sector, uh, that, which is worth billions and billions of dollars. So we're not talking about them, something that's, that's small. Um, so I'll leave you with that. And uh, uh, again, apologies for the, for the problems and, uh, and I'm very glad that uh, uh, the, the organizers had the foresight to have me send over my slides uh, in case something happened. So, and it did. So I will uh, uh, take any questions for the time we have left. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, uh, Luis, again. Um, so just, just on that last note, we had a quick question come in. How much of the world's gold supply comes from, from artisanal gold mining? So you said it's billions of dollars. Obviously, gold is very expensive, so you know that's hard for us, for me, to translate into sure. like a percentage, perhaps. Or sure. is there is there in, is there information on this, and 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 what is what is sort of the thoughts? Yeah. That's right. Two two key two key things about ASGM uh, and artisanal artisanal and small scale gold mining. It's about twenty percent 
between 20 and 22% of the world's gold supply. So it's a, it's a significant amount. And also ASGM is the number one source of anthropogenic mercury emissions. So essentially most of the, uh, it's about 40, 40, 41% of mercury that's released in the world comes just from uh, artisanal scale gold mining and it's about 20% of the world's gold supply. And it's, and it's essentially very poorly regulated. So it is very likely that uh, artisanal scale gold mining is mixed in at most stages of the gold supply chain. So there is a very good chance that even if you go to a reputable dealer, let's say you go to your local mall and you buy a ring or a necklace or something, that there could be uh, some uh, illegally mined gold in that. So uh, this is kind of early days. It's more likely that you know where your coffee and orange juice comes from than you know where your gold is coming from. And that's a very important uh, message to take away from that is one of the, uh, you know, there's much said about the Kimberly process with diamonds, with blood diamonds, and that really did transform that kind of luxury good, but gold is really just starting off. Uh, and it's something that, um, that we really need to kind of uh, bring up to speed. If I can buy my chocolate and I know what farm it comes from and what the name of the farmer is, um, I don't think there, uh, you know, it's unreasonable to ask uh, where uh, gold is coming from. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, Lisa. And I and I want to ask a follow up question to that. And actually, perhaps for for both uh, Diana, Irene, and, and Luis, uh, to to both here, um, I think that there's there's going to be some obviously some sector specific challenges when you think about both the impacts of ASGM and also you know you're talking about governance or regulation, right? And this difference, this spectrum between informal and formal, and it's not a dichotomy, right? Like I think we understand that there's this like sort of you know, spectrum, a continuous spectrum of like how formal something is and, and, you know, individual stakeholders within that, where they fall on that, on that spectrum. But I think my question is, you know, you have these subfields in the, in sort of the innovation prize, right? And a lot of the work that you presented was sort of, you know, generating this information or this data to say sort of, okay, like, can we reveal what is perhaps private information, right? Like, can we find out where, and when and how this this mining is happening using drones or whatever there's a there's an engagement question i have like that's a more detailed technical question of like you know what is the interaction with the community around uh you know flying drones and stuff i think that uh when i worked in peru which was admittedly you know 15 years ago i think uh it would have been the, the people I was working with would have been uh, very skeptical of me flying drones, but I think that you obviously have a deeper set of collaborations and teams. Um, I guess my question is, where is the real barrier to getting to that point to where you can you can have that sort of supply chain? So I, I noticed that like the challenges were supply chain and formalization, which are, you know, part of that is information, but what are some of the other challenges people can be thinking about, right? in terms of engaging with the different stakeholders and how to get different stakeholders and incentivize them to be, you know, working in this different way. Like we can both understand the cost, but I wanna think about what are some of these other challenges that you're seeing in those particular subfields in sub challenges, if that makes sense. Sure. Well, for, for uh, supply chains, like the one that's really touted now is blockchain. Um, because part of the, part of the challenge is um, being able to transmit the information about where the gold is sourced and where it's produced and then transmitting uh, it up the value chain. So, you know, if, if a consumer is going to pay extra, basically just think about kind of like organic coffee, it costs a few bucks more. Um, essentially, this, the idea is the same, that that, that uh, good behavior is rewarded by a premium. That information needs to be verified all the way through uh, the chain or else it drops. Like once that link is broken, then no one's going to say, hey, I'm going to pay an extra couple bucks or, you know, uh, hundreds of dollars for something that's responsible, both in terms of labor responsibility, um, social responsibility, uh, and e e environmental responsibility. So the, the, the way that that is verified um, has a lot to do with technology. Um, there could be remote sensing and just making sure that the area that is being mined is, is correct and is following some route or it's not deforesting things. Uh, it could be the way that you just maintain the, the signal through kind of digital means. Uh, blockchain is something that I mentioned. 
Um, also, um, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, are there ways to use uh, material physics to understand um, where uh, gold comes from? Uh, we work with um, a physical chemists, the material chemists for using isotopes um, for uh, not just isotopes for mercury, but isotopes for gold. Um, there are very few, but essentially, how do you use those uh, types of solutions to understand where metals come from? Um, so they're not being swapped because um, the illicitness uh, uh, gives a lot of incentives to cheat. Um, so uh, those are some examples of, of how you can do that. Uh, of course, through uh, uh, platforms and, and accountability, uh, data chains, uh, it's, a, it's important to maintain that. For formalization and the use uh, for, uh, uh, for just the regulation, maybe you would think of it as kind of like both carrot and stick. Maybe the supply chain is more of the carrot and the formalization regulation is, is a bit more of the stick because you have to be taxes and you have to comply with laws. It provides the tools for governments to be able to regulate it effectively. Um, generally, ASM is, uh, ASGM is done in areas that are very remote and hard to, to go there. Um, I think that you've worked in areas as well that are like Madre de Dios and these Amazon areas, I mean, they're very far away. They're not close to the presence of state. So, uh, and if there are agents of the state that usually are underfunded. So it's actually very difficult uh, to do this. So, and are there ways to do this remotely? Are there ways to do this at lower costs? Is there a way to basically transform data into information so it's used by, by folks that are not used to this? So this is something, as you mentioned, drones, it was something new 15 years ago, but essentially everyone's got drones now. So it is not so unusual, uh, but you know, uh, it becomes kind of like a cascade of problems. Before it's hard to get drones, then it becomes hard to get the data from drones. And now you have so much data you're drowning in it. Like how do you transform that into information using AI or something like this? And then how do you actually do the training? And this is something that the colleagues in, in Colombia had talked about. How do you train people up to be able to use the data, absorb them and make decisions? So lots of, lots of entry points, I think. Um, and, and it create and, and a lot of creativity and, and imagination is what I think where we're looking for because a lot of these problems are not new, but um, the scale of the problems are growing faster than the scale of the solutions. So I think that we want to move away from the usual suspects and bring in more people to think about this. We need more minds, and we need a lot of really a lot of young uh, energy. I think to uh, to kind of you know join the, uh, the people that have been working at this for many years, I've been working on it for better part of 20 years, because I think that we're plateauing. And that's, I think the last thing I wanna say about this is that we need more hands to this job because it's outstripping the ability for the current solution makers to, to get a handle on it. It's growing. The price of gold basically drives this in 80 countries and it's accelerating. Um, because of the pandemic and all everything there. So that's, that's uh, one of the also reasons why I think that, uh, that we need to really engage on this, on this issue. Yeah, thank you, Luis, for, for outlining some of those problems. I wanna ask uh, Yana and Irene well, one question. I think perhaps then we're gonna have to wrap up looking at the time. Um, but, you know, Luis, you're talking about a lot of these sort of decision makers. We're getting information for these decision makers. And what I'm really interested in is that like, there's this system of different decision makers who objectives I, I imagine are not all aligned. And I, and I wanna pose this to, to, to our, our uh, Colombian uh, colleagues here. You know, you guys, it seems have spent a lot of effort really thinking about both uh, dissemination of information to a variety of stakeholders using a variety of avenues. But I'm wondering about, you know, we have these sort of society level problems where deforesting the Amazon or we have mercury pollution, right, in a, in a community. But I imagine the community is not all aligned, right? It's not a monolith, right? So you have these stakeholders who might have different views. And how did you guys sort of, um, you know, approach uh, stakeholders within the same system that might have different needs or need information in different ways, have different beliefs about the system? Um, in, in trying to maybe not necessarily build consensus, but get actionable improvement uh, on, you know, using this new information that you guys are generating through monitoring, right? So I imagine that, you know, if you're, if you're directly involved in gold mining in a particular way, you know, there's differences between the gold miners also, right? So I'm just saying with this variety of stakeholders, how did you guys approach sort of the different objectives and how that made you think about your strategy for trying to get improvement on the outcomes you care about. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. No, and I think that uh, not only like all communities are heterogeneous uh, within, but also the the use of mercury creates difference. No, so for example, the miners may be defenders of the use of mercury, whereas the women that are, have to be responsible of the uh, unhealthy children, they are against mercury. And then we have this kind of gender divisions, but also family ruptures that come with the use of gender. So the first thing was to actually realize that difference and try to understand it and understand what are like the variables that make the difference. And we then came with the gender difference and also the gender and then from that uh, like realization, we decided to first focus in the youngsters because we knew that by educating the youngsters, then later they could take better decisions. And also we have tried to make workshops with the miners because something that we discover as well is that some of them that used to use traditional mining are now incorporating the use of mercury to try to make more profit. And that's something very relevant because, I mean, this is like an impoverished community. So it's also a social and an economic problem. And we have to deal with that dimension as well. So it's not only to criminalize the miners that are using mercury, but try to understand where is it coming from and how can we solve it. So it, it, the, the solutions are not only technological, the solutions are also social and economical. Uh, and with those miners, first of all, we have tried to educate them as well, because we are sure that uh, if they understand that this is also going to generate problems for them, then they can also uh, make better decisions. But we know uh, for certain that they still need the transition and they need uh, some opportunities uh, to do it different. And that's something that is also responsibility of the government. And this is when things become very difficult because the government is very good at criminalizing, at persecuting, at making those miners illegal, but it's not so efficient at providing solutions or at providing monitoring and other alternatives for the communities. So we are trying to compensate that uh, through education, basically. And we are very, like, we believe that education can be a route out. Uh, and we work with the social organizations from the territory. So we have decided to always like dialogue with them and to try to make sure that we uh, are on the same level in terms of what is the objective and where are we taking this information and these results to. Actually, what we have discovered is that in many cases, uh, the institutions are like in opposing uh, positions as compared to communities. So the, the, the institutions may be pushing, for example, for formalization and for um, making a corporate mining. So they call formalization, but really what they want is to make corporate, corporate business. And the local communities, the ethnic communities, they want to continue being a small. They don't want to transition to corporate large scale mining. So there is like this tension between what the community wants and what the uh, national government wants. And part of the challenge is to understand the politics of the mining setting, no? what, what, what are the forces, what are the interests. And, uh, and having said that, I wanted to take the opportunity to react to something that Luis just mentioned in relation to where is the problem coming from. And when I heard that the prices of gold are generating this uh, boom, this rush for gold, I think it's also very relevant to control the demand for gold. And what is the responsibility of the financial sector in all these cows? Because it's very easy to go to the poor, uh, to the poor chain, no? So the poor people from the Amazon that are trying to make a living out of, um, of gold mining, of course, being damaging for the environment and damaging for the health. But where is the responsibility of the financial sector that are the people who have the money and that could be controlled in the global north? So I think that kind of like global uh, dynamics have to be taken into consideration. 
Yeah, I will uh, try to add uh, just in the context of uh, how technology and technology that produces information is used uh, to produce, you know, this data. Um, I, I think in, in this situation, it's very important to keep in mind that the, the context and knowing the context is, is extremely important. For instance, Luis shared some pictures of Peru and flying the drones there. If you try to fly a drone like that in La Toma, it's going to be taken down by an armed group that we don't know <laughs> where is like where the fires yeah. coming. So you know, we really need to, um, in in our context at least in Colombia, work from the bottom up and include the communities, and that's just also part of our philosophy um, for for this research. Um, and how we want to approach this problem. You, you can uh, think about top-down solutions involving governmental organizations and companies and all of that. Uh, but we decided to go the other way around and uh, take the challenge from the bottom. Uh, and that's just our approach and that's um, how we do it. But we that's, understand that that's different depending on the context. Yeah, that's... that's uh... Well, this is why we had multiple people presenting today. I want to um, take a moment to just thank all of our participants for staying with us past. Uh, I think that's really my fault as the moderator, because I was so excited to hear the responses from Luis, Diana, and Irene. I want to personally thank uh, all three of you, uh, both for sharing your own work, um, publicizing the, the, the prize that is coming up, uh, and hopefully giving out connections uh, making new connections with people that are either working in the same areas or in the same zone, or uh, as we said, uh, inspiring new people to work in this area. I'm gonna include myself in that number. Someone that's now very excited to connect with you guys later and 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 work on uh, uh, artisanal gold mining. Um, I think it is a very important problem and I think it is a systemic problem. As you mentioned, Diana, there's gonna be lots of approaches. There's no, uh, a pardon the pun here, gold bullet that's gonna solve this problem. Um, but, you know, we need lots of people working on this with lots of innovations. I think there's opportunity for technology, there's opportunity for policy, there's opportunity for lots and lots of different, uh, you know, leverage points to try and improve the situation. I think we can see the existential impacts that are happening uh, right now just through photos. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Yana, but I just want to thank all three of you again for sharing your time, working through the technical difficulties, answering questions, being so flexible and, and so passionate and doing such great work. So I want to thank all three of you. Um, and I will turn it over to Yana. And I want to thank our participants uh, one last time. So Yana, please take it away. Thank you, Jesse. I don't think I can say it better than that. Um, I definitely uh, echo the need for all hands on deck and whatever we can do at Engineering for Change to support this effort. Uh, please consider us your ardent champions. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our attendees and of course our presenters. Uh, we are going to uh, get you back to your uh, regularly scheduled programming and uh, hopefully we will see you all at the next seminar. Please stay tuned for the recording that will be published on Engineering for Change and we will attempt to address uh, many of the questions that we couldn't tackle uh, with follow-up um, on our platform. So thank you everyone, good afternoon, good evening. Good morning, even if wherever you are, and we'll see you on the next B4C seminar. Take care. Thank you all.